1922 in Eastman, Georgia. And uh, what else did you want? Your current address. My current address is 96 Lincoln Street, New Britain, Connecticut. 06052. Which war did you serve in and which branch of the service? I served in World War II in the Army Air Corps. And what was your highest rank? Uh, my highest rank was flight officer. Now you told me off camera that they don't have that rank anymore? No, that, uh, that designation is, has been eliminated. Connie, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Do you remember what year? I have to give a little thought because I, um, when I went down to enlist, I was still in high school. And I took, had to take, uh, I wanted to get into the uh, Tuskegee program, uh, I should say the Tuskegee experiment, and I had to qualify by taking academic exams and physical exams. Uh, after quite a struggle there, I was uh, informed I, I had passed the requirements um, and I was informed that I would not be accepted until I finished high school. So I would probably have to say my, my real enlistment was when I finished high school, was, which was uh, June 1943. Um, I was, uh, I have to use that as the date I enlisted. I, I had written the president before that because I, I knew that I was going to be, be uh, drafted um, and I had met the requirements uh, for flight training. And in fact, I was at headquarters at the, uh, down at, it was five fitting to be drafted when um, my papers arrived uh, i had written president roosevelt who i'm certain didn't get that letter but they had followed it up to boston <clears throat> one of his uh one of his secretaries probably and uh, the general sent my orders down that uh, i was except that uh, as a candidate for the Army Air Corps, which yeah. is which is a, which is it didn't go quite that easy, but that's another story. And if, did you want all of that? Well, tell me where were you living at the time? I was living in Hartford, where I grew up. Uh, yes, I actually would like the whole story. Um, Connie is one of the famous Tuskegee Airmen uh, from the Tuskegee Experiment in World War II. So, yeah, would you tell me the whole story behind applying for the Tuskegee? Yes, yes. Well, I, um, the first time I went down to take the, the academic exam, uh, I received a letter two weeks later that I had failed, and I took the letter and went down to uh, the induction center and uh, asked to speak with whoever was in charge, and it was a captain. And I finally got in to him. I told him that uh, I had not failed that exam, and I could prove it to him. Well, he had few choice words for me, but uh, I was determined that I was going to, to uh, get a fair hearing. And um, he finally called the sergeant and said, bring Napier's folder in, which he did. And he said, uh, I said, Captain, I can tell you what the questions were, and I can give you the answers. 
So he said, oh, you, you were a real wise guy. I said, no, sir. And he said, okay, number one. Uh, I gave him the question and the answer. Then number two, the same. Number three, I did the same. He said, wait a minute, I don't believe this. He said, where did you memorize this exam? And I truthfully said, sir, I have never seen it except for the time that it was given to me here. I've never been able to do this since, and I was never able to do it before, but I could mentally see that that uh, questionnaire. I guess it was prompted by a sincere desire to get into that uh, experiment at uh, Tuskegee. Um, he said, okay. He said, look, you're going to take this exam again. He said, but it won't be the same exam. I said, fine. So I said, I don't care which one you give me. I intend to pass it. I said, I have one request. He said, well, what's that? I said, I would like to observe whoever reviews my answers. <laughs> and with that, he kicked me out of the office. <laughs> I was a wise guy. <laughs> but uh, um, he did allow me to take it two weeks later. And I received, about a week or so later, I received notice that I had passed. And I was sent to Westover with a flight surgeon to examine me. At the time, I had uh, I was considered one of the best athletes in the New England high schools. Um, and Dr. Jackson, our family doctor, had, had told mom and dad that Connie is as perfect physically as it's possible to be. So I didn't have any fear or worries about passing the exam. But uh, at Westover, the flight surgeon was examining my eyes with an instrument. And I didn't know what he was doing, but he was measuring the distance. My pupils were apart. And, I, and he kept shaking the instrument and re-measuring it. And I said, he was a major. I said, Major, what are you doing? What, what What's wrong? And I, my... My heart was in my throat. I said, oh boy, they found something wrong with my eyes. And in those days, if you didn't have 20-20 uh, vision or better, you were just out. Um, he says, you're a freak. Well, I was, a, I don't know, 18-year-old or so, uh, and I... Uh, didn't like the idea of somebody calling me a freak, even though he was a major. Uh, <laughs> and I was ready to show I did. I said, what do you mean I'm a freak? He said, your pupils are farther apart than the normal. So he says, that could make you a freak because you're, <laughs> you're not within the norm. So very fortunately, instead of... Uh, Acting like an idiot, I said, sir, if my pupils are farther apart than the normal, it means that my peripheral vision is greater. He said, yeah, you're right, that's a fine. That makes me better suited as a flyer. And he, he laughed and said, boy, you must, I think you're going to make it. <laughs> and, and with that, uh, I uh, returned home from Westover and told mom and dad uh, I was elated. Dad was quite proud, but mom didn't want her son to go anywhere. Uh, time kept passing by, and it got to the point I received a letter to go down to the induction center to be inducted. And with that, I was furious. I sat down and wrote President Roosevelt. Yeah, I you know, during the time of war, the president doesn't have time to read a letter from a high school kid. But you couldn't, you couldn't stop me by telling me that. The letter was sent to the general in, in charge up in Boston. What did your letter say? My letter, the letter. <laughs> When I was down being inducted, 
I was standing in line to be inducted. I, my name was called out. Someone said, Connie Napier Jr. I said, yeah. I said, yeah. He walked over, Sergeant walked over. He said, you see these stripes? I said, yeah. He said, I'm a non-commissioned officer. You say, sir, to me. Well, I was upset. And as I have said, physically, I figured, I don't care whether you were a gorilla, I could grab you and give you a tough time. <laughs> and I, I was kind of looking for a way to vent my frustration because I figured I met the requirements and they're still not going to give me a shot to fly. Well, while, I'll say, discussing what we're doing, what is discussing. I was hoping that Sergeant would grab me so I'd have a have a chance to revert to the law of the jungle. <laughs> but uh, he didn't. But I noticed a fellow walking towards us. And I could see he was an officer. When he got closer, I saw his insignia. And he came up and he said, are you cutting out here? I looked on his shoulders, and there was an eagle there, and there was an eagle there. And some said, this guy is a colonel. He's a heavyweight. You say sir to him, which I did. I said, yes, sir. He says, I don't know who the so-and-so you are. I don't care who you are. But the general up in Boston made me a messenger to send you or to give you these orders. And he hit me in the chest, boom, with some papers, and I grabbed them. And they, it was my acceptance to get into the, the Army Air Corps and go to Tuskegee. Well, I was a truly elated young fellow at that particular time. And I. I um, naturally told me that, uh, you know, I, I wasn't going to be inducted. Uh, or drafted into the, uh, the, the regular army. And I went back home, and they told me that I would get, that I would hear from the military again. Um, whereupon, some time later, I received orders uh, from the military that uh, I was to leave from Union Station in Hartford. Um, and um, Feldon Ritchie was to go with me, and, and for some reason I was the guy that was supposed to be in charge. There were only two of us, and I kind of laughed at that. But I had our, our uh, I was sent our um, meal ticket and whatnot. And we went down, and when they let us off the train, we were in Biloxi, Mississippi, at Keesler Field. And that was, <laughs> well, I wrote that two weeks later that I had already earned my overseas room because that was a different country, <laughs> particularly for African-American youngsters. <laughs> what was your understanding um, when you signed up for the Tuskegee experiment? How did you hear about it and what did you expect? Um, in those days, in the black community, you, to attempt to keep up as well as possible, those that could afford it would have one of the black newspapers sent to them by mail. Uh, there was the New York, the Amps, New York Amsterdam News, and Pittsburgh Courier, Chicago Defendant, and there were a couple of others. Well, um, when our paper came, it was the Pittsburgh Courier that Mom used to always get. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, though. Let me drop back. Lemuel Custis had been made the first African-American policeman on the Hartford Police Department, and he was there for I, I would say a year or more, and all of a sudden he di we didn't see him anymore. And of course, when anything was going on in the black community, 
uh, they always sent Lim. Well, we young fellas said, uh oh, the man has found out a way to get rid of Lim. I didn't want an African American <laughs> or a policeman anyway. Well, when we received that Pittsburgh Courier, when they, we saw on the front cover Lim with four other um, black soldiers, and they were the first five to earn their wings. Well, I had always wanted to fly when I was a, a um, I was preschooler on Worcester Street. We lived in Hartford. One Sunday, walking down, walking down the street with Dad during the summer, I heard a loud noise, and I grabbed his hand and said, "What's that?" Out, and he pointed and said, "See that? That's an airplane." And right then, I wanted to fly. Um, little did I know that uh, a war would come along and would give me the opportunity to, to learn to fly. Uh, I knew of a fellow by the name of Rostell who had a restaurant in Springfield. He was African American. He was the only, he flew, he had his own plane. Uh, he was the only uh, black flyer that I knew personally, I have met. I didn't realize that none of the flight schools would accept an African-American for flight training. Well, of course, the military didn't accept us for flight training either. And of course, the military in those days was totally segregated. Well, I, um, I grew up hoping and wanting to learn to fly. I knew all of the fellows that, uh, you know, the Colonel Roscoe Turner, and, uh, Wiley Post, um, and it never occurred to me that all of the guys were white. They were, none of them were, were black, you know. Uh, then, uh, as I got older, I began to find out things that uh, weren't too pleasant. Um, particularly for uh, an African-American. And, and uh, they're not perfect today, but a lot better than it was in, in those days. I, yeah, let me find myself again now. I, I um, grew up making models. It got to the point I would design my own aircraft and and, uh, and make a model and, and adjust it until it would fly and whatnot. Uh, and of course, uh, I I think that that desire to fly helped me equip myself to fly because. Uh, when I got into the higher grades, such as junior high and high school, I took courses and I, I love math and I love physics. Um, um, and I took those courses that were more difficult because I wanted to be in a position to uh, go in whatever direction that I wanted to and I always I always uh, felt I would would uh, continue my education and go on and in, in going to college and whatnot. I I don't uh, I don't believe that uh, I would have been able to, as an example. Uh, pass the academic requirements because those exams were really set up for um, an individual who had uh, at the very minimum a year of college and pre preferably two or three years and you were much better off with four years but if I hadn't uh, uh, I don't know had the desire and had had the family behind me 
mom and dad and grandma, because grandma always said well, that whatever, I won't be here when you grow up, but whatever you do, you be the best. If it's the bum on the corner, you be the best bum on the corner. And she meant that. Um, she was quite a proud lady. And, and of course, she was uh, like dad. They were, they were strict disciplinarians. They'd give you the coat off the back, but you had to stand up and, and uh, face the music if you <laughs> got out of line. Uh, Grandma was uh, quite a lady. Her father was a Cherokee chief. Her mother was an African woman who had been sent over on a slave ship, but who did not go into slavery because an African chief married her took her as a wife. That made Grandma a, a, a Cherokee princess. But you, the truth of the matter is you would, have, you would know that she was um, a little different. She's an extremely proud woman. And uh, she always, uh, to me, she always dwelled on higher things than uh, than the than the average person. But um, I I often, had often wished that Grandma had uh, had had survived long enough, but she'd been quite old if she had. Um, particularly when I earned my wings, because I was her little warrior. She used to take me back south. She didn't like the cold weather here. Uh, she used to take me south every winter with her until I started school. I actually started school in, in Eastman in, in Rose's class. It wasn't a public school, but uh, uh, black youths were not allowed to go to public school in, in, in those days in the South. Um, and there were no equal but separate schools. None of them had been built in those days. So Miss um, Rose opened her house. She had been fortunate and received a decent education somehow. And uh, she was a teacher for um, black males and females, and the school was her house, actually. Um, but that's another story. Well, it uh, would be a long one. Now, when you, once you did see the article in the Pittsburgh Courier and decided to um, apply for the Tuskegee experiment, what were the requirements to get in? The physical exam and the... There was academic exam? academic requirements. See, a high governmental officials and military officials had publicly stated that black, they didn't say young men, they said black boys did not have the academic mentality or the physical requirements to learn to fly and fight in the air. And we knew that they didn't know what they were talking about. Um, and I can't, I will not use the, the language that we use amongst ourselves, but uh, <laughs> we, we, we used to say this country's got to, gonna lose this war if that's an example of clear thinking because it doesn't make any, it doesn't make sense. Well, at the time I was, was, uh, Um, in junior high school at Northeast Junior High in, in Hartford. Um, I was the president of the class. I was the number one athlete of the class. I said, something's wrong. I said, if that's the case, all, all of these students must be true idiots. Because if I'm if I'm the guy that's that's a, a, a front, and uh, the same thing happened when I went to Weaver High with the with, uh, president of the Athletic Association and whatnot, and went on, but but that's uh, 
that's why I, 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 I had to take the, the, the exams and as well as anyone else to get in and that's, that's the way that was. So now when you got to Biloxi, that's where you were going to do your basic training? The basic training, no, the, well, I, that, can, that can mislead you. You had to be a qualified infantryman to go to any specialized school. So before you could do the Tuskegee thing, you had to go through the infantry training? Yes. And that's what you did in Biloxi? Yeah, at Keesler Field, Biloxi, Mississippi. And how long did that take? Uh, oh boy, I think it was two to three months. Uh, you know, this is we're, we're going back sixty <laughs> some odd years. Two years, huh, So you did your basic training there. Yeah, it was probably a couple, a couple of months, if that long. Yeah. Now, in basic training, you were segregated also. Oh sure. The military was totally segregated in those days. Now, what was basic training like? Oh. Well, it was, uh, I guess it was tough, but it wasn't, uh, but it wasn't, um, all of those that were in, 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 in the outfit that I was, in, was with me, we were pre-aviation cadets. All of them had their eyes set on getting to Tuskegee. So whatever we had to put up with, you did. That's all. It didn't, uh, you, you never stopped to say, oh, they're giving me a tough time, or this is rough and whatnot. You're, you were aspiring to fly, and you had, if that's something you had to go through, fine, you go through it. That's all. Do you remember any of your instructors? Where? In, at and Keesler Field? I'm sorry, where? In Biloxi at Keesler Field. Um, not, not really, not by name. I, I don't, uh, I say it with, with, with tongue and cheek, I, I was, I was amazed at some of the, 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 the fellows who were corporals or sergeants, um, and they didn't impress me as, uh, you know, non-commissioned officers. Uh, I, was, I was disappointed in what I found, except when I got to Tuskegee, then it was totally, totally different. After your basic training, uh, where did you go? I went to Tuskegee. You went right to uh, Tuskegee. Was, uh, yeah, they sent me to Tuskegee with a group of other fellows from from uh, from uh, Keesler Field. Um, and what and was I, that like? Back then. What was that like? What did they train? That you was there? totally different. That was totally different. I remember it was at night when we arrived. Uh, uh, the train. Did not stop at Tuskegee. We stopped at Chihaw, and we were picked up by six by six trucks, army trucks, and taken to Tuskegee Institute to the campus. And I, it was it was early night, and I can recall that. Uh, the atmosphere was just different. I, 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 without even meeting anyone there, when we were on the trucks, when we got to the campus, everything seemed to be different. I don't know why. I've never figured that one out. But I was there. We had to go through an accelerated college course. And I, the second day I was there, all of a sudden it hit me, I said, how did I get to that point in the so-called Tuskegee experience? Because 
I felt as though I was walking amongst giants, and that's not, I'm not over exaggerating it. Uh, the, the, I often wondered how did I get there? Um, and of course here again, all of the instructors and whatnot were black. In fact, my physics instructor would have to leave every once in a while, and we never knew where he was going. Later we found out that he was one of the physicists that the government used in solving the problem of producing the A-bomb. What the government had done was to spread the problem around a different physicist that uh, I guess they felt had the ability to do it, and uh, every once in a while they would have to get together and put their work in with the others. Uh, I'd like to put one little thing in. I had always felt, I, I was never guy to, to brag or anything, but very silently inside I felt I could uh, stand with anyone. That is until I got to Tuskegee and when some of those black fellows there that were my age, some that were older, one of the fellows in my class had his masters from MIT, and he was my age. I said, "How in the devil did this, this ever happen?" You know, it, it was unbelievable. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I don't. Uh, it reinforced my belief in my. I have to say my race, and that there were men and women of the stature that I found there, and they were black like me. Uh, I had never felt that I was inferior to white or anyone else. But meeting the people that I met, who I've felt were head and shoulders above me. I said, Connie, you may you may be able to do it, but you got a long way to go, buddy. And that's uh, that's what kept me uh, I think it helped me to uh, drive a little harder, to try a little harder. And and uh, I, I when I when I go out to talk to youngsters at school and whatnot, I I try to impress them with that that you can, no matter what the odds. There's no such thing as failure because when you don't accomplish, it's because you quit, and if you never quit, you can never fail. So it, it's. Uh, I'm getting way off on it. You were very challenged. How long was the training at Tuskegee? Well, I was at Tuskegee the first time, a very short time. I was at the... Um, now the first time was for the college course, the acceleration? The college course, but while there, instead of seeing Moton Phil, who's where they were, were actually flying Moulton? out of, Moton. Spell that. I'm not sure of it. M O T O N. I'll con I can I can check it later. All right. Um, that was the field. T O N. That was, that was the name of the field. The, the uh, um, that um, the Army Air Corps quickly put together because here again. It was, there was total segregation. We couldn't learn to fly on a field where whites were f flying, you see. But one morning about 
uh, which was normal for us to get up and, and be ready at, at five to, to begin our day. We were all, we were called to the, the auditorium and we were told that each and every one of you will be allowed to come up and voice your protest, but Uncle Sam needs bombardier navigators, and you will become bombardier navigators. Of course, the big moan went up, said we volunteered to become pilots, bombardier navigators. Well, the fellows that they had called there were fellows who had, in the in the academic requirements who had qualified for all three, any one of the three, which I didn't know then. None of the fellows knew. We didn't find that out until we were, most of us were out of service. Well, what was the, the three? Pilot, bombardier, uh, navigator, or the, what's the a other one? Pilot, a bombardier was separate, and a navigator. They made us bombardier navigators. So you were one fellow. Jobs. Yes. Um, well, they sent us to Midland, Texas, and um, so were you chosen at that time? And they said you're going to be a bombardier navigator. No, I, you know, when you're in service, you can volunteer for whatever you want. But if they decide to send you somewhere else, that's it. You have to. Yeah, you're not. They're not, <laughs> you can't take them to court and say, hey, you're not mistreating me. <laughs> so we were sent to, to Midland, Texas. There were some fellows were sent to other, uh, Hondo, Texas, and there was another, there was another training field also. Um, but we went to, uh, we, Complain didn't make any difference. They were had decided to put a a medium bomb group together. Well, if anyone on that aircraft was a black, they all had to be black. You couldn't. There was no such thing as. Uh, well, here again, total segregation again. Um, we had uh, bombardering and navigation there, and they sent us to Midland, to uh, Tenderfield, Florida, for flexible aerial gunnery. And um, observation. There was a there was a it was a specialty you know, taught you to to uh, how to observe and to to know what you see. As an example, even now, if 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 a group of people see an accident, everybody will give you a different story. Uh, but it was actually good training because it taught you to know what you actually saw and not. <laughs> not have it varied due to your own experiences and whatnot. Um, so that most of us, when we received our, back at Midland, Texas, we received our bombardier navigator wings, we were also qualified for about to wear about five different types of wings because of the different schools we had gone to. And we had, we had been sent to different schools because the military didn't really know what to do with us. And they could not, they could not uh, integrate crews in a, in a bomber, even though the U.S. had been losing uh, heavy bombers. Uh, and on those big wars, be uh, the 24s, be 24s, and the flying fortresses, uh, uh, they were 10 to 12 
young Americans that would go down any time that one of those aircraft went down. And those are the planes that the Tuskegee men who were fighter pilots uh, were finally released to escort and and uh, they stopped the loss and they had they were, they had a loss then we're losing from 30 to 40 percent of those those big bombers on a mission because the U.S. was bombing during the day England was using Lancasters at night they had quite a loss also but the U.S. had the greater loss as I said 30 to 40 percent well the Tuskegee uh, fighter boys, <laughs> fighter boys, didn't lose any, and of course most people uh, have been informed of that now. But um, I think that pers that kind of persuaded the government into seeing what we could do as as bombers <laughs> and bombers ourselves, and why the 477 medium bomb group was put together, which was all black. B. O. Davis had been ordered to come back um, to the States to take over the 477th. So that was your group? Did you meet him? Did you train oh, him? Oh, sure. I had met him before. Benjamin Davis? Yes. Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, the first black, the first black uh, four-star general, Chappie James, and I were good buddies. <laughs> but he was a lieutenant <laughs> back in those days, <laughs> and, and there's a joke on me, I guess, uh, sitting at the at the, the supper table one night. My wife said to our youngsters, and we had four daughters and and, and a son. Uh, in the paper, uh, Chappie's picture had appeared, and he was to speak at Trinity College. Well, I had studied at Trinity after I got out of service. Uh, I, I, I became an architect after I got out of service. I, part of my studies were at, at Trinity and whatnot. But uh, um, Barbara said, uh, your, father, your father flew with him. He, he had three stars then. And, and when we went over, and, and, and when he was giving his uh, uh, his little discussion there and a talk with him, he, he informed us that he had been had been notified that he was going to receive the the fourth star. But when he walked into Trinity, he, 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 there was Lim Custis, Tuskegee Airmen, Ed Hall. And myself, Ed Hall and I had had become brother-in-laws because the woman I married sent her picture to me while I w w was in service, and her kid sister was on it, Betty. And Eddie Hall saw Betty's picture, and he said, "Wow, who is that?" I said, "Oh, that's that's my number one kid sister. She was." few years younger than me, you know how at that age, because uh, <laughs> I knew Betty before she knew herself. But uh, Eddie said, when I get out of here, I'm going to come up and marry her. Oh, you said, oh, sure, okay. <laughs> but no one, but he did. Eddie was quite a smart fellow. He was a, a mathematician and a, and a uh, physicist, and he became uh, a specialist in metallurgy over at Pratt and Whitney, and was the first black to head a department there. But um, so that's how Eddie and I became. And I always say I played Cupid. I said because if you hadn't seen the picture that I showed you, you would never have met your wife. But anyhow, um, we um, Barbara told uh, the kids your, your dad flew with them. <laughs> and as it would be, one of the kids said, Dad, what happened? I said, what do you mean, what happened? What happened to you? I said, nothing happened to me. What are you, what are you talking about? He said, he's got three stars. He's going to get the fourth star. You didn't get any stars. <laughs> well, <laughs> what are you going to do? Well, 
that's, uh, I think that's, like most things in life, that was pretty good. It keeps you in your place. You don't, if you, particularly, if you have youngsters, they're going to be, they're going to be tough on you if you're parents, and you, you have to stay sharp, particularly while they're around the house. Uh, we had, uh, uh, we had a lot of fun raising a family. And, and, now, and go back to Midland, Texas. When you were there for the Bombardier Navigator training, yeah. what kinds of, what, and you flew out of that field, what air, kinds of aircraft did you use? Oh, did oh, the B oh. The no, no, uh, uh, we had, uh, <sighs> it was a beach craft that we were trained in. But um, we had oh I I, I should have brought the model of the the, uh, the aircraft that we had in um, in the in the four seventy seventh medium bomb group. It's a B two five J B twenty five J. Um, I have photos of that, but I also have a model what like so of that. Uh, B-25 that we had. Wow. Okay, so then, and, and when you trained in that, where would you train? Like you would fly all over the country? Yes, you could. Uh, we, uh, um, anywhere that was necessary. I, Yeah, and he, sometimes you'd have round robins for long distance and whatnot, and and, and uh, you, we flew all over the states. That's the best I can say, really. And then you would also have, so you'd have flying time, but then you'd also have classroom time. So when both you, at both. So you at both at the same time, and you'd just be learning all of the jobs for being a navigator and all of the skills for being a bombardier? Uh, yep. You had, uh, uh, you had ground school for bombardiering and ground school for navigating and then flight for bombardiering and flight for navigation. They were, were, were all, but you also had uh, in flexible gunnery, you had ground school and flexible gunnery, you had uh, flying time uh, as well. Um, As a bombardier, what would be the responsibilities of the bombardier? Well, they had two, in those days you had two bomb sites, the Spurry and the Norton. I, I selected, you were allowed to let, select which one you preferred. I preferred the Norton bomb site. And uh, your job was to, uh, when, when the aircraft arrived uh, at, well, I'll have to explain one thing to you. When in, you were taught, you, if you had a target, you would not head directly towards that target. You selected another potential target and, and headed towards it. And the reason for that was it was an attempt to throw the enemy off as to where you were going to bomb. When you arrived, and that was called an IP point. When you arrived at your IP point, you turned in, headed then to your true target. The bombardier, the pilot would put the aircraft on automatic flight. But the bombardier controlled it at that point through the bomb site because you had to fly uh, true and level and at the proper speed so that the projection of your bomb would be where you wanted it to be. And that was, uh, so his job was to, uh, to, to drop the bombs, and, and of course the navigator's job was to uh, direct the pilot to where he should go, because there were little, you know, 
things such as you, know, you got crosswinds and whatnot can throw you off. Even if you hit it right, you have to adjust for it. And uh, uh, that was part of the 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 uh, navigator's job, but. If you ran into two winds that were throwing you off your course, you could check whatever your drift is through that site, bomb site, and in your navigation, you could calculate what what direction you have to go so that uh, uh, your drift would not would be um, compensated for so that you hit the target that you want. So it's uh, it was it was two jobs that it was combined into one. Where were you when you went on your first flight? Who? Very first time that you got in an airplane in your training. Very first time. No. Very first time for bomber during and navigation, or very first time for for I see I went back later. the part of the story. I went back to Tuskegee later for pilot training. So. <laughs> oh well, we'll have to get to that. The first time you were in an airplane, because it must have been pretty exciting when you after wanting to fly from when you were a little kid, and then you finally get in an airplane. It was not that exciting because it was for bomber during a navigation. And that wasn't exciting. So you exciting. weren't so enthralled with it. Yeah, it was exciting when I when I soloed it at Tuskegee. That's when I that. But I was already an officer then. I had gone back. See, see, see. my story is a peculiar story. Now, it. it uh, I went with the four after I first earned my wings as a bomber navigator, and I was assigned to the 616th Squadron, the 477th Medium Bomb Group. We were flying out of Godman Field, Kentucky. Uh, so after you that's that's Kentucky is now when did you actually so after you went to Midland and then Florida is that when you got your wings as a bomb no back at back at Midland Tech back at the uh, Midland Texas you got your your wings for 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 uh, bomber during a navigation now, they were you made an officer at that time yes so what did you become flight officer at after you finished your bombardier school well, yes all right, so then as a flight officer, you went for your training in Florida. No, no, I was still a cadet. Oh. I went back to, we had to go back to... Uh, Midland, yeah. that's when you got it. Mm -hmm. All right, so then after you were, you, you got your wings, and they formed, was that the first time they formed that group, the 774th Medium Bomb group? I'm sorry. Was that the first time they were making that group, the 774th? 477th. 477 oil backwards. Bomb group? Yeah. Yeah, that we, we, yes. Right. They were, it was in the process of being put together. Is it still a group? Hmm? Is it still in existence? It was a, a bomb group. That was the first that was putting it together. You, know, you had to have all, all the, all the pieces that went together. You had to have pilots, you had to have bombardiers, you had to have navigators, you had to have uh, flexible gunners. All right, so then when you became an officer and got your wings, what did you do? You flew that's, out of that's when I That's when I was, uh, well, what did I do? <laughs> You're going to be sorry you asked me that. What I did, I received my wings on December 1st, 1944. December 11th, 1944, I was back in Hartford and I married Barbara Harris. <laughs> wow. And yeah. while, while I had a two weeks delay in route, while in Hartford, I received a telegram from the military that um, I was to report to Godman Field, Kentucky. I'm going to have to, we're going to have to cut. <laughs>